All right, uh, I have the uh, privilege of introducing Stephanie Singer, who uh, we've interacted for a long period of time, electronically, where we've now met in the flesh, and uh, I'm looking forward to hear what she's going to say about free and fair open source election software, which she's surely an expert on. Thank you. Thanks, Bob, and thanks to the California Election Integrity Coalition and the Voting Rights Task Force and all the other organizations listed on the program that sponsored this conference and made it happen. And thanks to all of you for paying attention to this issue. Really, democracy needs people like you doing what you are doing right now. Democracy cannot succeed without that kind of involvement. So thank you. And run for office, absolutely run for office, every one of you. Uh, I did that, by the way, I was an activist in Pennsylvania. I ended up running for the Philadelphia County Board of Elections and I got elected uh, and it was the most amazing experience of my life. Um, well, other than my daughter, but you know. <laughs> um, so uh, I want to talk about the voting technology market and uh, why we are where we are and how we get out of that. Uh, so I am a principal project lead at a company, a private sector company called Free and Fair, uh, which is a spin-off of Galois, which uh, David Jefferson mentioned as uh, some of the people who have hacked into various kinds of systems uh, when it was legal to try to hack into them. Um, and uh, we are right now developing risk limiting audit software for uh, Colorado, the Colorado Department of State, and that will be in use for the first time in November. Um, really, uh, that's, that's what we're up to. So uh, election officials want secure voting systems. They really do want them. And people know how to build secure voting systems. And I want to be clear that I'm not saying people know how to build systems that can count votes with no oversight, OK? You want paper ballots. You want risk-limiting audits. You want all the kinds of things that people have been talking about here and that you guys have been fighting for. You want those things. And you want the computers that do play a role in the process to be built in the most secure possible way. And people know how to build secure computer systems, uh, the military, NSA, all kinds of organizations procure by securely built uh, computer systems. Again, they need oversight, they need to be audited, they need to be checked, all those things. Uh, but I'm going to be talking right now just about the computer systems component of it. So uh, if election officials want it and people know how to build it, what is wrong with this market? So uh, in any market, you can go into business and build products, or you can go into business and build services and provide services. And as anyone in business will tell you, uh, products are better than services because you design the product once, you build it, you sell it over and over and over and over again. So if you think about uh, how much money companies that actually produce cars make as opposed to design companies that work on designing cars, uh, it's really in the producing of the cars that the money is, the big money is. Likewise, uh, for prescription, for, for medicine in particular, well, for medicine, okay? So the big drug companies that actually produce the pills, that's where the big money is. And the actual chemistry that goes into designing the pills, I mean, compare an academic salary to the salary of a sales, or even within the company, compare the, the, the chemist's salary to the salesperson's salary, okay? It's in the selling of the product. Next. So, um, so there's just a lot more money in products than in services. And one of the things that's going on in this market is that 
selling proprietary voting systems is selling a product. You design it and then you sell it over and over and over. You sell it to San Francisco, you sell it to Philadelphia, you sell it to Inyo County, you sell it to just sell over and over and over. Um, whereas designing open source, you're really providing the company that does it and that is what free and fair is doing and wants to do much more of. Uh, we're selling a service. So this is not a, a huge money endeavor, okay? Even though it is a private sector endeavor that is for profit. I don't want to make any uh, claims that this is not a for profit company. It is for profit. Um, so, uh, okay, let's just go to the next. Yeah, so <laughs> the big money is in proprietary, sell the same thing over and over, because you can charge everybody for the research and development. When you develop open source, you only get to charge one, <laughs> one client for the research and development. So for example, for Colorado, we have developed a risk limiting audit system. And now that it is developed, and now that it is licensed with an open source license, Anybody can use it, so you guys can use it in California from any state in the nation. You can just go, uh, if you know what this means, just go to the GitHub and just get the software and take it and use it with our blessing and please tell us about it because we'd love to know what you're going to do with it. Um, but that's your choice. You don't even have to tell us. Okay, next. Um, okay, so this question came up. Are open source systems more secure or less secure than proprietary systems? Well, look, in theory, any, they can be built securely or not securely. This is true of open source systems. This is true of proprietary systems. So in practice, in practice, if we want secure systems for elections, you have to look at the incentives because to have a secure election system, you have to provide real incentives for the people who build the system and the people who buy and use the system. You need to provide them incentives for security. And here is why I believe that open source systems in practice will be more secure than proprietary systems. And it has to do with the incentives, not with any you know, not with anything inherent to open source. So what is the incentive to make your system secure? Okay, there's a moral incentive, and that's, that's the same in a proprietary or open source company. So like, think about two companies. Think about your favorite proprietary current election vendor, <laughs> proprietary. Think about free and fair. Uh, there's a moral imperative for both of us. We care about democracy. Uh, so that's the same incentive. There's the certification incentive. Our products need to be certified. They need to stay certified. If someone breaks into one of our products, like what happened in Virginia, it will get decertified, bad for business. That's the same for both. But there are some, uh, some things that are really different and that make stronger incentives for open source. One is rigorous testing. So not just certification, but if free and fair builds a, uh, an open source bit of election technology, uh, sure, the certification labs will test it. But Harry Hursty's gonna test it too, right? So, did he spoke here earlier? No, oh, no, okay, so the smartest people you know <laughs> who care about elections are also gonna test it. Everybody's gonna test it. So you have much more rigorous testing with open source election software. Um, and then the other thing is, customer trust. So, uh, and by customer, I mean the election official. So, for a proprietary vendor, if the election official says, is this secure? The vendor says, yeah, it's secure. And the, and the customer has no other way to build trust or to assess trust. In, in the context of an open source system, the election official says, is this secure? And free and fair can say, yeah, sure, we're so smart, it's secure, right? Just like a proprietary vendor. But the fact is that other people will be testing it, the customer has other options to assess the, whether, the, whether the product is trustworthy. So again, it's not that open source is in and of itself some magically safe thing, it is not. It is not inherently secure automatically. But in the context of elections, it 
is a more secure way to bring software and computer systems into the process. Okay, so, so if that's true, uh, oh, and I also want to say the other thing is that it is so much cheaper, so much less expensive, that it is a way to get good systems in place because of how strapped uh, election, um, election boards are for resources. Okay, so if open source is so great, why don't all election officials insist on open source computer systems? I, I think there are a lot of reasons, kind of sociological reasons, if you know any election officials. Um, it's, very, it's very hard for them, it's very risky for them to do new things. So, so the heroism of someone like Chris Jordanik should not go unnoticed, okay? This is a difficult thing. It's also most election, boards of election are not, they don't have someone who's a software programmer during the day. So most boards of elections do not have the kind of in-house technical expertise um, that will give them the confidence to make independent judgments about technical issues. And for that reason, their relationship with their vendor, their election technology vendor, is a very important one for them because that is a relationship with someone who is technically sophisticated. And that's very important. Um, and, and now that people are starting to talk about, uh, about open source election technology, there's pressure on election officials who are considering it to reserve the intellectual property rights. So, um, and, and that's, that seems to be very real. Um, and, and I think it comes from, uh, you know, people who run counties and states tend to be generalists, okay? You don't, it's hard to get into office as a specialist. You have to be a real generalist. Um, and so, uh, you cling, you, cling is the wrong word, oh my God. To, um, it, in order to do your work, you have to trust your gut on a lot of things. And uh, this one comes down to why would you give something away for nothing? Okay? Property rights are valuable and uh, the county should keep them. And it's, so, well, let me not get lost on this particular uh, direction. Okay, but I want to call out the election officials who are working on bringing open source technology into the election space. One is Wayne Williams, uh, the Secretary of State of Colorado. So he uh, has um, asked for open source. He, he, the Department of State is licensing in an open source way so anyone can use it the risk limiting audit system that Free and Fair is building for them. It will be in use for the first time in November. Yeah. So, and by the way, the legislature told him, you gotta do this risk limiting audit stuff. They didn't tell him you gotta do it open source. Okay, so he gets real kudos for that. Um, another one is Dana de Beauvoir in Travis County, Texas, the county clerk. Uh, she uh, has done something really amazing, gone a long way towards designing the star vote system, which uh, is, if you're going to have computers in your election system, this really like does everything thoughtfully, thoroughly, uh, as securely as you can. Um, it's a terrific system. Um, and uh, alas, uh, <laughs> this is a really sad, I, I mean, it's just, it's kind of heartbreaking. Um, they just shelved it, and they shelved it because, uh, basically because the traditional vendors said, uh, if you try to do this, we won't build anything for you. We won't sell you anything if you try to do this. Um, so we're hoping that someone will pick up the star vote, um, maybe even San Francisco will end up procuring something like star vote. There's a lot of great work in there. Okay, uh, so Travis County, Texas, that's Austin. That's a big county. State of Colorado, that's big. Uh, the city and county of San Francisco, pretty big county. Um, these are doing, I also want to call out Cami Foote from Inyo County, California. That's a tiny county. 
um, and she has, at every step of the way, invited open source responses to all to the to the to the requests she makes for proposals for uh, election technology. Go Cami. So yeah. So so there's a lot of great stuff here, and and I should say that if you really pressed me, I could take a pretty good guess at the. Um, well, I once looked up what parties these people were all in, as far as I know, and I don't actually remember. But uh, it, they're certainly okay. Wayne Williams is a Republican, and I'm pretty sure Dana De Beauvoir is a Democrat. And this is not at the county level; doesn't seem to be a partisan issue. Next. Okay, so what can be done? Well, $10 million would be enough to fund a secure open source computer voting system design, which could save over $100 million nationwide. Again, I want to say, this, you still need audits, you still need paper ballots, you still need all of that, you still need citizens coming in and watching every step of the process with a really jaundiced eye, okay? You still need all of those things. But to have the computer systems at the core of it doing the jobs that computers actually can do pretty well, um, $10 million, which could save over $100 million nationwide. So. I just thought it might be fun to look at some things that people are spending $10 million on these days. I just looked these up. I just did a Google search on my way here. So, for example, uh, repair and revitalization of a five-acre park in Seattle, Washington. 76 units of housing for the chronically homeless in Spokane, Washington. Uh, expansion of a freeway intersection in Los Angeles, California. Now, these are absolutely worthy things, okay? <laughs> I mean, no question, right? Um, right, so is democracy for the whole country, right? Um, okay, uh, naming rights for the Rose Bowl hedges for 25 years, and Beyonce just sold her Midtown Manhattan condominium for $10 million. So what can be done? Somebody, somewhere, can come up with $10 million. It could be of uh, philanthropy, it could be the federal government, the Department of Homeland Security, right? Somebody can come up with this $10 million. And when they do, you can bet that Free and Fair is going to bid on that. We are dying to build that for the United States of America, any country that wants it. We want to build it, we're ready to build it, and, uh, and, and we want fair competition for it. So if there's someone who can do it better than we can, come on down. Um, but that is what it's gonna take. And it's really not that much money. And there really is a lot of attention right now. You may have been watching the Paper Act move its way through Congress or the uh, Graham Klobuchar amendment to the NDAA, and maybe those things will pass this year, maybe they won't, but we're moving in that direction. Uh, so if anyone has $10 million lying around looking for something good to do with it, please consider this. Uh, if you have less money hanging around and you want something good to do with it, consider verified voting. Uh, money, money really matters. It really, really matters. Donations allow organizations like Verified Voting to really um, expand what they can do. And that's hugely important. Okay, so uh, that's pretty much what I wanted to say about open source technology, why the voting, the, the, the market for election technology is a very strange market. It's not serving its customers well. Um, and uh, open source is a way to provide better product at a much lower cost to the customer who is, in the end, the American people and democracy. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, hi there. I have to tell you, I'm extremely skeptical about open source. I don't question your intentions personally, but when I hear people talk about open source, I just, inside of me, I, I feel like it's a trap. 
and at, um, at best kicking the can down the road. So do you agree that even with open source, there's no, it doesn't provide any protection against hacking during transportation, maintenance, or installation of the voting machine systems? All of those issues are an issue with open source or proprietary. Yes, so, so I, ag why, I agree, okay. yes. So why are we spending so much time trying to come up with another type of electronic voting machine, which is open source, rather than figuring out a way to um, hand count the paper ballots from the start, the elections? At a, at a minimum, some sort of a bifurcation. It seems like the energy should be directed there to a, toward a truly transparent system, and in, I'm concerned that I'm, I'm meandering a little bit. I'm, I'm concerned that Woolsey, for example, has come out in favor of open source, and I know he's anti-Russia, but he's, what, he also is on the Trump transition team, which suggests he's pro-GOP. And there may be some, there are some Republicans in here, I know, but what if this is just another plot? So we're gonna get these great open source machines on the assumption that we'll do um, risk limiting audits that will never happen because the states will never pass them. And then we've just kicked the can down the road another 20 years because yes, 10 million is less than what we spent on the last round of machines, but it's still 10 million and it's just gonna set us back so that for the next 20 years with our open source, we're gonna have open source and no risk limiting audits to so, go with them. Uh, so first of all, reasonable people can disagree about hand counting, its, its feasibility, its accuracy, all kinds of things, Re and I don't want to have that debate. The risk limiting audits, they're happening in Colorado. It, it's, these, these things are, these states. things are not, these things are not, um, it, they're, they're different, they're separate issues. Whether you have risk limiting audits, it, that's a separate issue from whether you, you have them on open source technology. They're just, it, it, so my, my advice is take the issues that you understand, you care, you are passionate about and advocate for them. Um, and, and as you advocate for them, try to convince other people to advocate also. Um, but reasonable people can disagree and it's gonna take all of us working and pushing to make everything we need come together for election integrity. Thank you. Hi, Karen McKim, Wisconsin. Um, this question might come across as a little bit uh, challenging, but I I'm on your side, you're doing good work. I just need this clarification. Um, in Dane County, Wisconsin, because that's where I live and where most of the members of my group live, we've been doing citizen audits of Dane County elections with risk limiting auditing a couple weeks after election. The Dane County clerk won't give us the ballots or access to any of the information before he's already certified. But as soon as we can get it, we get it, and we've been doing risk limiting audits. We've been using Phil Stark's University of California Berkeley website, the tools page, to tell us how big the sample size needs to be, to help us with the random selection of the ballots, to tell us if we've got enough of a statistically significant margin, then we can say, ah, confirmed. It's a wonderful website, very easy to use. We do it publicly with everything on a screen like that, so the public can just follow along, and they can follow Phil Stark's website, fine. Okay, so what is it you guys are doing in terms of automating risk-limiting auditing? I mean, at some point you've got to have the ballots and manually see them and count the votes, and software can't really help with that, can it? That, uh, that's right, so, so thank you very much for the question. Um, so I would say the basic question is, what, what does our system give the Colorado that Phil Stark's website doesn't give Colorado? Okay, and that's a perfectly fair question. And by the way, our system is built on Phil Stark's algorithms, uh, which are, you can think of them as open source, <laughs> okay? Um, so, so the Department of State in Colorado, they have to, there are things they have to do that you don't have to do when you're doing an audit in one county or in one place. So there are ballots in county seats all over Colorado. The information from the voting systems has to come into a central system and be organized so that you can run Phil Stark's algorithm on it. Um, the counties, there has to be communication between the Department of State and the county seats about which ballots have been chosen for audit, things like that. So, so when you have 
counties that are in different physical locations and ballots that are in different physical locations. There is coordination that has to happen. Okay, comment from someone who's actually done risk limiting audits in Indian County. That's a real problem and it really needs to be solved. And if you've got it solved, great, because statewide elections need to be audited. Yeah, and, and to your other question, in the counties, what is happening is that citizens are looking at physical ballots that were marked by voters and compare and, and entering their interpret you know marking recording their interpretations, which are compared to the uh, ones that come out of the election system. Thank you. Hi, Stephanie Lulu Freistadt. I'm a journalist. We've spoken. Hi, Lulu. Hey, nice to meet you in person. <laughs> so, uh, I guess a little bit continuing conversations that we've had. Uh, this is all really interesting for me. To hear, I loved your presentation. One of the things that you and I spoke about was that if, in order for citizens to actually be able to check that the risk limiting audit is what it says it is, there's a, a document that you guys call the cast vote record file that is going to have to be released publicly. Otherwise, no one will really be able to double check this. And when I spoke with you, you had said that Colorado was hedging on whether or not they were going to release that cast vote record file. So what did they decide and what kind of protections would be in place to make sure that other states would also be releasing what, it be, what information would be necessary? Because I know personally I've been in like battle with a Florida county for a year trying to get public records. No, this is a this is a huge huge issue, and um, here is where Colorado seems to be heading on it. Um, and, and so, for the cast vote record is the file that comes out of the computer that lists what the computer says the ballots said. So it's the computer's interpretation. Um, so, and in order for the public to really review the audit, and it, it's, an, it's a crucial piece. So currently, um, there is some information in the files, in those files that cannot be released because of Colorado's law protecting voter privacy. Um, and so those, those columns will be redacted by the counties before those files are sent for the upload. And so the public will have access. This is the plan, and please check and you know, make sure it happens. But the, the plan is that um, the public will have access to those redacted files, which are exactly the files that go into the risk limiting audit system. So if your goal is to check the risk limiting audit system, you will be able to do it with those files. And, and you will, this may be a little technical, but there will be a hash on those files, so you will be able to check that the, what the county uploaded is really what the state got and is really what you are looking at as a member of the public. That seems like a contradiction to me, to say that it's redacted, but the public will have access to it. Like, it's either one or the other. If it's redacted, then the public doesn't have access no, to sorry, it. No, sorry, redacted just means one column is removed. All the other information is there. The so it's like redacting the, a document where you, you, you black out someone's name. So there's some information that's oh. not there. But the information that's necessary to check if the, if the, vote, if the ballot that you actually... Because my understanding is you've got to check specific ballots against the cast vote record file, and that information is all going to be public. That's right. Okay. That's and right. Can I do... Oh, you've got to you, turn you the people. three people behind yeah, you. Sure. For a couple of years now, we've been hearing about down in L.A., uh, Dean Logan is leading a project. Is that open source or is that something different? Well, that's a checking? very good question. Is the L.A. Contrast? project going to be open source? And uh, they have put out their first part of their RFP for that project. It does not mention open source. And there has been no verbal commitment from L.A. to make that project open source. So is it going to be open source? Maybe, but the fact that they have said that in order to even look at the second part of the proposal, people have to get background checks and sign a non-disclosure agreement makes me think that it's probably, probably not going to be open source. Jan Bendor, uh, I appreciate your mentioning the problem of trust. As an election administrator, I have sat through dozens of dog and pony shows given by machine manufacturers. And I always ask, who owns your company? And the salesmen never know. 
Uh, there's a company that has chosen a rather unfortunate name, Dominion Systems. <laughs> <laughs> That's also the name of a right-wing religious movement. And they're headquartered in Toronto, but nobody can tell me who really owns the company or where they make their stuff. I can't find out es and S. I just know they're headquartered in Omaha, but who really owns them? Now, we all remember when Sequoia was owned by the government of Venezuela under Hugo Chavez, that was, that was a very trustworthy situation. Uh, we could have any of these companies actually owned by the government of China, coupled with the secrecy of their proprietary software and the threats that they are actually giving election administrators. My county clerk told me that before he can receive his new uh, central count software, he has to give back the old software. I don't know how you give back old software. Uh, somebody tell me. But, uh, and he's literally sweating bullets over this. And I said, well, is that in a contract that you signed 15 years ago for the, this old stuff? And I actually FOIA'd all the county contracts and I couldn't find any language, but he's been threatened. Yeah. So is that trust building? I mean, what do you know about why these people are operating this way? Well, I, okay, this is, I don't know why they're operating that way. I know that they have cornered an extremely lucrative market, and that may be part of it. And, and this MO has been working for them for quite a while. So it's a good gig. Why should they stop? Well, I think we should work on that and force them to disclose who they really are. Hi. Have, have you worked on any sort of timeline that might be required to develop open source system and develop the laws that would support the uh, mandatory risk limiting audit? What sort of timeline is the organization working on? Are you just assuming there's a market and go for it? So uh, we are not an advocacy organization. We are a private company building software and some hardware systems, actually really designing software and hardware okay. systems. So how, so for risk limiting audits, for example, mm -hmm. really it's up to the states and it's up to people within the individual states to advocate right. within their states and how long it takes you know, it, it took over 100 years to, to ratify the 27th Amendment okay. to the Constitution, right? I, I mean, so, who knows, right? So you're not seeing this as an immediate... Um, it's, it's starting. It's available in counties and precincts and some states. But, uh, yeah. Are you uh, a lobbying for any national recognition of your list? Um, well, look... Risk-limiting audit? Yeah, so in the Paper Act and I believe also in the NDAA Amendment, Klobuchar-Graham... Um, I believe risk limiting audits are in both of those. And these are federal legislation. That's federal legislation. So we're nationalizing and, and elections, basically, based on a presupposition of ongoing electronics. Is that well, where we're headed? No, I, that is, that, Kinda having that the way. federal government say, look, we'll give you money if you'll institute risk limiting audits is not, a, in my view, a federalization of elections. So uh, reasonable people can differ yeah, on I that. I understand that. You are lobbying for legal national standing. Last question. Oh, okay, my follow up with you, Stephanie. Um, so, one of the concerns that I do have about the software that you're developing is that now we have a system with this implemented in Colorado where software is checking software, basically. And I, my experience just from researching, researching, researching your company is that you have a really knowledgeable security team, like headed by Joe Canary, um, which makes me feel better. Um, but my, I have, so it's a twofold question. Specifically, one, what is Free and Fair doing to make sure that when you have software checking software, that 
the, the, the software auditing isn't being hacked or manipulated, and two, how would we have any confidence that that would be the same if some other company was developing software for risk limiting audits? Yeah, thank you. That's a really good question. So, um, so all of this falls apart if real people don't watch the process. So if it's just software watching software, I'm with you 100%, okay? What the system that we are building for Colorado is a system to help them organize information at the, at the very end of it, it's kind of the, you have citizens who are checking these ballots themselves using their human judgment. And the fact that in the software is that those judgments get transferred up to the Department of State or whatever, right? I mean, there, there are all kinds of software places where it is vulnerable, which is exactly, I think, your point. It's vulnerable in a lot of places. So always, 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 we need real human beings to be checking every step of the way. It's kind of like ballot custody. When you have paper ballots, right? You need to watch the custody of the ballots from step to step. And now this is a little harder for the average citizen to get their mind around because it's not just pieces of paper being carried from place to place, which is familiar to all of us, but it's actually software doing things. Um, However, it really is true that there are protections at every step of the way. There is a kind of chain of custody of this information, and enough of it is public to allow the public really to check. And I, I can't explain that fully to you right now, and I, you know, let's talk about it. But that is really true. So if you have the time and energy and resources, including access to some people who can think about things more complicated than ballots being carried from place to place, you will, you will be able to understand that this custody chain does not break. But I agree completely, it's not obvious from the get-go. So this is just a quick co couple of quick comments. One is that uh, the NDAA does not contain the amendment. Thank you. So, and the second thing is that Rhode Island, I think yesterday or the day before, the governor signed the risk limiting audit bill. So Rhode so, Island will be doing risk limiting audits as well. Right. Rhode Island. All right. Rhode Island. Stephanie Singer. Thank you. Thanks.